Well, we have been going through the Foursquare Distinctives, and we are a Foursquare Church. We're part of the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. Um, the Foursquare Church emphasizes four major ministries of Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the Healer. He's the Baptizer of the Holy Spirit. He's the soon-coming King. Um, we've worked our way down to the final week on the Holy Spirit part, the Baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Um, I've been kind of um, taking a sidetrack on unity because of my conviction based in Scripture that the place where the Holy Spirit moves is where there's unity among God's people. And if there's not unity in God's people, He's not going to be able to move much there. The Lord is a spirit of unity. He wants unity. He'll work. If, you're, if your marriage is not unified, if you're at odds with each other, God's not able to do there what he wants to do. If your church is not unified, if we're just backbiting and gossiping and criticizing, God, the Holy Spirit, will not work here the way he desires to. And so I just felt the compunction to kind of get sidetracked and talk about that and emphasize it. I'll be finishing that emphasis this morning, which will lead us next week to start looking at the fourth distinctive, which is Jesus is the soon coming king. He's the returning king. If you saw the signboard out front when you drove up, it says, Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? Um, For certainty, he is coming back. Um, I know sometimes it seems like, well, if he hasn't come back in 2,000 years, are you sure he's coming back? But the Bible even addresses that. It says the Lord is not slow as some people count slowness, but he is patient with you. He's not willing that any should perish. Um, The Lord would probably like to wrap it all up too, except there are people yet to be saved. People that he sent Jesus to die for. People that he wants with him forever and eternity. And so the Lord has to be more patient with degradation in this world than you and I have to be patient with it. Because he still wants people to be saved. Still wants people to turn and and to, to know that their sins have been washed away. So... Starting next week, we'll talk talk about the return of Jesus. But for now, finishing up on the Holy Spirit and on unity. Um, Two weeks ago, when I was starting kind of this emphasis on unity and the Holy Spirit moving, I quoted Psalm 133, verse 1, which is probably like a normative passage on, on unity. And it says there, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. And another uh, further verse down in that psalm, it says, there the Lord commands his blessing. It doesn't say that maybe he'll do something if you're unified. But he says the Lord commands his blessing where the brothers dwell together in unity. Don't you want to be in the place where the Lord is commanding his blessing? Not suggesting it or saying maybe, but saying there I Put my blessing, I command it shall be so. And God says he'll do that when there is unity. Last week we considered whether it's possible to have unity with everyone. And of course we we said no, it's not. And then I posed the question, is it possible to have unity with anyone? Because we're all so different. We have such different convictions and and even cultural backgrounds. And I emphasize that, that, that every church has a culture even a church that tries to say, well, we're, we're going to be above that. We're going to be without culture. That in itself becomes their culture, trying to say we don't have a culture. It's impossible to be a human being and not to have culture. It affects the way we think. It affects the, what we want to eat. It affects, um, affects how we worship. It affects how we act at a wedding reception. It affects how we celebrate um, events that are happy. I remember, for example, when uh, Mark, our youngest son, proposed to Kay at a church picnic roughly 10, 12 years ago. We knew it was going to happen, and and I know um, Kay's father knew it was going to happen. Mark had asked her permission and all. And it was a really special time. The way Mark conducted was pretty special. And I found myself so not intrigued and not quite amused, but fascinated with the different way the Ignacos celebrated when Kay said yes and the way the Joneses do. And the Ignacos, you guys can be a really noisy, celebrative 
bunch of people. And that's wonderful. And if you weren't that way, you'd be denying who you are. Whereas the Joneses tend to be kind of subdued. Oh, congratulations, Mark. I'm really excited for you. We don't, I don't know how to jump up and down. I, I really don't know how to do that, okay? It's, just, it's not comfortable. You could say you're going to give me $50 million this afternoon. I say, really? Thank I really appreciate that. And I'll give you a little embrace. I don't know how to act the other way. I just don't. But that's what the way culture is. That's the way culture is. So, we saw last week that Satan counterfeits everything that God has made. Whatever the Lord has made, Satan comes with, up with the counterfeit. Whatever good thing the Lord has created, Satan comes up with something that looks like it's the same, but it's not, and it's evil. It's bad. It's wretched. It's wicked. He even tries to counterfeit love. And we use that um, popular, we didn't use it, we refer to the popular expression, love is love. And Satan tells us, well, really all that matters is love. If you love somebody, that's all God cares about. He's a God of love. God is love. And so if you love somebody, you can do anything you want with that person because it's love instead of abiding by the truth of God's word. Satan says that all that really matters is love. And that love trumps truth. And that's not supposed to be a political statement, so don't go on that this morning. The most di diabolical form of this is to say that all roads lead to God. That's like the ultimate diabolical form of love is love. All roads lead to God. Doesn't matter what path you're on, what you believe, what you think. You'll all end up in the presence of God. You'll all go to heaven anyway. That's the ultimate, most diabolical form of love is love. Different world religions, Satan would say, they're just different paths to the divine. It doesn't matter which one you're on. There's no one right one. They all end up the same place. And I hope you comprehended from last week that the only real unity is with those who have the same hope in Jesus Christ. They're the only people you can really have a heart unity with. Other people, you might have a form of unity. Maybe you work together as co-workers. Maybe you're in the same family. But the only people that you, your heart beats with them are people who are part of the body of Christ, who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The only access to God is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Don't fall prey to the world's popular idea that all roads lead to God, just different ways of getting the same place. To, to fall prey to that is to say Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. Jesus was wrong. You really want to choose a path where you're saying, well, Jesus was mistaken. He didn't know what he was talking about. I don't think you want to go there. Jesus, John writes, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, meaning the anointed one, the Messiah, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So even though the only real unity is with those who are equally in Christ, last week I began to describe that it's even hard to walk in unity with people who are in Christ. There are many injunctions in the scripture. That means a command to be of one mind. And they're addressed not to believer or non-believer. They're addressed to believer. Giving commands to believers over and over and over again to be of one mind. To be of one heart. To walk together. To, to work together. To love one another. And the fact that the, the New Testament gives us so many injunctions implies that the Lord knows it's not going to be easy. He didn't say it's going to be easy to do this. If it was easy, he wouldn't have to keep reminding us to put up with one another, bear with one another, show love to one another. We have different backgrounds, different histories. We have different preferences on how things ought to be done. We even have different convictions about things, sometimes even interpretation of a, of a scripture verse. 
And I shared that famous quote that the founder of the Foursquare Church liked to use. She, didn't, she wasn't the first person to say it, but she was known for saying it. And it was, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Let's look today at part of Israel's history. We're going to see a time when they came together in unity. They had not been unified. They had been very separated. They had not wanted to talk to each other. But someone adjured them, begged them that, look, it's time that we came together in unity. And they did. And the Lord was able to to do a magnificent thing. Um, I have to give you some background. This might get a little bit complicated. I'm going to try to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. And as I told Beth this week, I just hope I don't say the opposite of what I mean. Sometimes just in the nervousness of preaching, I suddenly say the exact opposite. And I hope I don't as I try to paint this picture of a time in Israel's history where you might be confused. We all know that David was king over Israel, King David, um, sometime around 1015 B.C. And when he became old and the time of death was drawing near, his son Solomon who was the product of um, David's adultery with Bathsheba, was anointed king in his place. King Solomon was incredibly wise and incredibly wealthy, and that's a story in itself that the Scripture tells. But King Solomon, for all of his wisdom, for all of the opportunities God gave him by making him both wise and the wealthiest man to be on the face of the earth at that time, He disobeyed God in one very key point. Last week in our message, we emphasized a scripture that says that we should not be unequally yoked together, that we should not form intimate ties such as business partnerships or dating relationships or marriages with people who are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture is very plain about that. And I think I made a pretty strong point last week on it because I don't want you to make that mistake. It never ends well. Even though people think, well, it's going to work. It's fine. Don't worry about it, Pastor George. We love each other. Um, It never ends fine because almost always the believer is drawn away. The believer is drawn into lukewarmness or into just turning their back on the Lord, just enjoying life. Um, It's never a good idea, can I say this, to go against what the Scripture says. It's never a good idea to go against what the Scripture says. Because you're you're taking on the Lord and His truth. (laughs) It's just not a good place to be. Stick with what the Lord says in His Word. Even if everybody else denies it. If you're the last man standing, last woman standing, stick with what the Lord has said in His Word. That's always the best place to be. Solomon, again, for all of his wisdom and wealth, went against the Lord in a very key point. He decided to be unequally yoked with women. He had an eye for women. You know what that means. You know what that means. Well, Solomon was like the, um, the preeminent guy with the wandering eye that could never get his fill of women. He had, all told, 700 wives and 300 concubines, a thousand women. And they were not Israeli women. They were not Jewish women. They were not under the covenants. They were from other nations. In Solomon's eye, I mean, they were just, they were just gorgeous. They were breathtaking. He, he had to have them. And just like the scripture says, those women drew Solomon's heart away from the Lord. The wisest man who ever lived had his heart drawn away because he decided to to go against the word of God and and prove God wrong on that point. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam, everybody say Rehoboam. Rehoboam. Rehoboam took his place. And just like the concerns that we have when there's a change of administration in the White House and we have a presidential election coming up, we wonder, well, if this person wins, what's going to happen? If that person wins, what's going to change? What's going to happen? 
Well, Israel had the same concerns. And all of a sudden, Solomon died and Rehoboam takes his place. Everybody's wondering, well, well now that Rehoboam's in the White House, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to our property? What's going to happen to our, our pension funds? What's going to happen um, to, uh, to all the laws in the land? Same concerns. Solomon had been tough. He had been a taskmaster. He had not been an easy king to live in Israel under. Now, there's another man in the picture named Jeroboam. Everybody say Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Jeroboam was, in my opinion, a statesman in Israel. Just one of those people that bubbled to the surface that he was a statesman. And he knew how to, uh, like Henry Kissinger was. If you remember Henry Kissinger, he was just an incredible statesman. Well, that's what Jeroboam was. Jeroboam had disappeared from the picture because under Solomon's reign, he fled. He fled to Egypt. And after Solomon died and son Rehoboam takes his place, Jeroboam comes back from Egypt and along with a contingent of other men, I don't know if they were women or not, I'm just painting the picture, probably they're just men, they went to talk to the new king. They asked for a meeting with King Rehoboam, and their question was, so what's, what's your kingship going to be like? What's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? What kind of king will you be? And they said, King Rehoboam, your dad was tough. He was a taskmaster. And we'd like to ask you to lighten the load, be a bit more reasonable with the people of Israel. So King Rehoboam, he, he listened to their question, wanting to know how things are going to be. He said, tell you what, Jeroboam, come back in three days. I'll give you an answer in three days. Rehoboam then took counsel with the old men who had served his father. And when I say old men, think old wise men. People that had learned a lot. They had learned... Uh, They saw the mistakes that Solomon made. They saw Solomon and his eye for for women, and foreign women women especially. They had learned a few things. And so Rehoboam starts by asking the old wise men how he should answer Jeroboam. And the old man said, well, if you'll be good to this people, if you will please them, if you will speak good words to them, kindly words to them, kindly words to them, they will be your servants forever. That wasn't the answer Rehoboam wanted to hear. <laughs> and he decided, I don't want to talk to old people. I want, I want some of those young whippersnappers, some of the guys I grew up with, some of the guys I went to high school with, some of the guys I went to college with. Let's ask them what they think. So he disperses the old wise men, tells them to go back, to go back to their, you know, coffee time at McDonald's or something and go back to doing what old men do. We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 10 what response Rehoboam got when he asked the young fellows what he should do. And the young man who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to the people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplines you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Jeroboam comes back after the three days, goes to King Rehoboam to to get the answer. Remember, he'd been told, come back in three days and I'll have an answer. Rehoboam gives him the answer and says, I'm going to be way worse than my father ever was. My little finger is bigger than my father's thighs. My father disciplined you with whips. I'll discipline you with scorpions. And at that point, Jeroboam and all the tribes, with the exception of of Judah and Benjamin, forsook Rehoboam. And Rehoboam ruled just the, the southern kingdom, it came to be called, the southern kingdom of Israel. Rehoboam, this evil king, just ruled over the tribe of Judah and part of Benjamin, while the northern kingdom was everybody else, all the other tribes of Israel. 
And that's what led to the division between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Israel. So northern kingdom was up there with, with like ten and a half tribes under Jeroboam, or at least that kind of a mindset. The southern kingdom was just Judah and part of Benjamin, and they were under Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the new super evil king. Over the next 50 years, there were quite a few kings in Judah, in the southern kingdom, where Rehoboam was. And finally, King Hezekiah came along, and he was reigning out of a palace in Jerusalem. And in the first year of Hezekiah's reign, he decided it's time to clean house. It's time to make some things right. It's time to do some things right. They haven't been done right the last 50 years, but now that I'm king, we're going to put some things in order the way they're supposed to be. He specifically cleansed the temple in Jerusalem and made it a place of worship again, of pure worship to the Lord once again. He repaired it. He reinstated the temple worship. Meanwhile, up there in the north, the northern kingdom, with all the other tribes, the people that had um, kind of fled with Jeroboam, they were invaded by the Assyrians. And many of the people in the northern kingdom were taken off. They were carried off by the Assyrians. Well, Hezekiah, down there in the south, reigning out of Jerusalem, for the most part, he was a good king. Now, he had his moments. We won't go into some of those details. We'll look it up later. Definitely near the end of his life, he made kind of a big mistake. You know, it's sad how sometimes people, they can live their whole life well for the glory of God and then really blow it near the end. I can't tell you how many pastor's conferences I've been to in the last 10 years where, where a major emphasis was on finishing well. Because you can be a faithful pastor of a church. You can have done a great job. You can have been a godly pastor of a church and yet somehow in your 60s or 70s or beyond, you just kind of lose it. And I think we've seen it happen enough in some pastors in our own denomination that our leadership has just over and over reminded people, people like me, make sure you finish well. You know, you, you might have done a great job the first 40 years, but, but just be careful because you can make some major mistakes near the end. So make your decisions carefully. Watch out for the traps that, that are there so you finish, finish well. Um, <clears throat> so all I have to say, King Hezekiah made some mistakes at the end, sadly. But for the most part, he was a pretty good, pretty good king, a pretty godly king. So he's down there in Jerusalem. He's cleansed the temple. He's restored the temple worship. He wants to make things right to the best of his ability. And he realizes that we have not celebrated the Passover together as all the tribes of Israel for a long time. And he decides it's time to make that happen again. There's been this huge division between the north and the south, but it's time to bring us together, the 12 tribes, and to again celebrate the Passover. I want you to listen to the appeal he made. In your modern-day context, you can almost think of it as he sent an email up to the northern kingdom, making an appeal, and reached out to them. And this is the story according to the Scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 30. So they decreed to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, that the people should come and keep the Passover of the Lord to the Lord, the God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not kept it as often as prescribed. So couriers went throughout all Israel and Judah with letters from the king and his princes as the king had commanded, saying, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return again to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hands of the kings of Assyria. Remember I said most of the northern people were carried off to Assyria? Do not be like your fathers and your brothers who were faithless to the Lord God of their fathers so that he made them a desolation, as you see. Do not now be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever, 
and serve the Lord your God, that his fierce anger may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. So the couriers went from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulon. These are tribes of Israel. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. However, you always have to notice the howevers in the scripture. However, some men of Asher, of Manasseh, and Zebulon humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. One thing you can learn from that is anytime you set out to do the right thing in the name of, of the Lord, you probably won't get everybody to agree and everybody to come together. But there will always be some who know it's the right thing and they'll respond. So don't shy away from, from calling on people to do the right thing just because not all of them are going to respond right. Because there will always be some who do. And why is that? Verse 12, the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart, to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. Many of them ended up in Jerusalem that year celebrating the Passover together for the first time in years. And I want you to notice, where did they get their one heart from? Those that came together and said, you know, King Hezekiah is right. We haven't done it for a long time. We've had our reasons, but he's right. We need to do that. We need to go to Jerusalem. We need to celebrate the Passover. Where did they get that heart from? The scripture says from the Lord. The Lord gave them that heart to come together to do the right thing. God loves unity. God promotes unity. I never want to be on the other side of things. When the Lord is saying something through somebody, I never want to be one of the naysayers that poo-poos it. I want to be one of the people that says, you know, this, this is the Lord. Beth, this is the Lord speaking. We need to respond this way. Our church needs to respond this way. I don't want to be one of those people that's always on the outside, always working against what the Lord is trying to do. So what can we learn from this? What does it say to us about unity? It teaches us that humility before God wanting to make things right before him and humbly reaching out to our fellow man, urging them to do the same, is where the Lord wants us to be. It's where he wants us to live. It's where he wants us to operate. God blessed Hezekiah's humility. He blessed Hezekiah's desire to return things to how they should be. In the temple worship and in the unified celebration of the Passover, which they just hadn't done for a long time together. The number one thing required for you and I to walk in humility with people, our brothers and sisters, is humility. The number one thing we need to walk in unity is to be humble, to not be full of ourselves, but to be humble before Firstly, before God, but also for our brothers, before our sisters. Humility is what allows us to come together. Humility is how we can achieve unity with those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Scripture says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if it is possible so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So in other words, if you just can't live in unity with your brother and sister in Christ, if it's just, just, just as impossible, don't let it be because of you. <laughs> let it be because of them. Don't you be the reason that you just can't walk in unity. You hear me? I hope the Lord is just helping you make applications in your families and in your lives and in your church right now as I say that. Because sometimes we get in these situations, there's, there's broken relationship. It can be serious. It can be 
grieving. It can be hurtful. It can be troublesome. It can make you wake up at night. And the Lord would say to you, don't let the fact that you just can't walk in unity be because of you. As much as it depends upon you, walk in unity with your brother and sister. And if unity just can't happen, let it be because the other person refuses. I'm not saying go accuse them of that. But don't be, let it be because of you. I could say it five more times, but I won't repeat myself. You get the point. Don't you be the reason. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. Don't you be the reason that the unity cannot happen. Humble yourself. Be the first one to extend the olive branch. It's hard to be the first one. If you just bring it back to marriage, for those of you who are married, you know, when you and your wife have, you know, you have something happened between you, you know the feeling. I can just tell you personal experience. I don't want to be the first one to say, Beth, you know, I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'd rather be mad for a while longer. I'd rather her be the one and say, George, you know, I'm so sorry for this morning. I shouldn't have said that. You know, there's something inside of us. It's that pride versus humility struggle that is common to the human experience. We all know it. I might not be able to describe it perfectly, but you all know that feeling inside of not wanting to do it and saying, well, I'll just wait for the other person because they were more wrong or whatever. It's because of the battle within us between pride and humility. It's really not even the battle between us and that person. It's the battle inside our nature between a sinful pride and a godly humility. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That's not even in my notes, but it's pretty good, I think. I think it's pretty good. Paul says to the Ephesians, I therefore, a prisoner from the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now that sounds pretty good. Bear with one another in love. Can I just translate that? Put up with one another in love. That's what it comes down to. Ladies, put up with your husbands. Husbands, put up with your wife. Church member, put up with the people in the church that you struggle with. Bear with one another in love. The Lord calls you to it. Put up with each other. Yeah, it's not always easy. It's not always fun. But it's where we should be living. It's where we should be dwelling. Paul to the Corinthians, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Having equal concern, rejoicing with those who rejoice, mourning with those who mourn. One of the reasons that I have valued so much being at this church for a long time is because of the seasons of life that you go through with people. And it's not just for the pastor, it's for any of you who choose to be here for a long time. If you're just here for you know, a few months, you never get to see it or experience it. But when you're here for years, you experience the times of gladness, the times of celebration, and the times of mourning. You experience the, the people that announce they're, getting, they're engaged, they're engaged. And you, you rejoice with their marriage, and you rejoice the day they might say, we're pregnant, we're going to have a baby. And you rejoice the first time they bring that baby to church. You get to be a part of that and celebrate. But alternatively, you're there when somebody announces they've just been to the doctor and they got a diagnosis they were never expecting. And you're there when you get the email that says, um, Bill Walters, back in May, home with the Lord, at home finally. You get, you get, the, you get both sides. You get to rejoice at the times of rejoicing. You get to cry with the times of crying. And that, for me, is one of the greatest reasons I've always wanted to plant roots down in a church and be there because you get to go through all these seasons with people. We've been through seasons of divorces with people. We, we've been through it all. But it's so valuable to walk through the good times and the bad times, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and to mourn with those who are mourning as the scripture paints the picture of right here. 
And if we just can't seem to achieve unity, if you've got somebody in your life that no matter what, they just, just can't be unity. You've tried. You've tried hard. You've done everything possible. You've been praying. You've done everything you know to do, and it doesn't happen. Then the Scripture would say to you, and I would say to you, love them anyway. Because there's, there's no exception clause in the Scripture. There's no exception clause that, well, you don't have to love people in this case. If they do this, then you're off the hook. There's no exception clause. Once in a while, there's been somebody that I didn't want to love. <laughs> I know you've never felt that way, Sandy, but sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's one of the reasons I'm glad I spend time with the Lord every morning, or most mornings, once in a while it doesn't happen, but because that's where the Lord kind of brings your, your consciousness around. It's when he deals with things and confronts things and says, uh, you don't have an option, George. You have to love that person. There's no exception clause. I'm not letting you off the hook. You have to love that person. <clears throat> you all know 1 Corinthians 13, the famous love chapter. People love to read it at weddings. I don't typically use it at weddings. I'm not against using it at weddings. This isn't typically my go-to passage, but it could be. Verse 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. We have spent a little bit of time talking about some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I've had a week talking about speaking in tongues. Paul says he's glad he spoke in tongues more than the rest of the, of the audience he was talking to. And yet here in Corinthians, he's putting it in perspective, saying that if I speak in tongues all the time, if I sound like the angel choir speaking in tongues to, to God, but I don't have love. I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, Give it all to the poor. And if I deliver up my body to be burned, then I'm burned at the stake for my Christian faith. But I have not love. I gain nothing. That's the perspective that God puts on love. And he never lets us off the hook. No matter what that person has done to us. There's no exception clause. If there were an exception clause... Jesus would have gotten off the cross. But that's it. I'm not doing it. I am not dying for these people. They're not worth it. I'm not going to love them that much. Jesus is our ultimate example of love. Love to the death. Love to the crucifixion. There is no exception clause. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Going back to that humility thing again. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. There's that putting up with one another in love again. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Don't you love what the Lord can put in two paragraphs? in terms of giving you something to strive for and to live up for. Love is not the same as unity. There's people I cannot have unity with because we, we simply don't agree on the essentials, who Jesus Christ is, the authority of the Word of God. There's churches I would not worship in. I'm telling you, I wouldn't worship them. I know what they believe. I'm not, you're not going to find me there. I'm not going to go there. I know I can't have unity with them, but God still says, George, you need to love them. You need to love that pastor. You need to love those people. He doesn't say, well, you don't have to love them because of what they fail to believe, they need to believe. I still have to love even if I cannot have unity. There are people we just can't be unified with, but just as Jesus loved us anyway, 
we have to love them anyway. As much as it depends upon us, live in unity with all people. That's what the scripture demands. It's what the gospel of Jesus Christ demands and commands. God's intention is for us to be like-minded and in unity with those who are in the household of faith. That really is his intention. It's commanded by him. It was seemingly impossible in our story we told today for the two kingdoms, for the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom to come together in Jerusalem and to worship the Passover. There was just too much history. There was too much baggage. There had been too many years. And yet it happened. Well, I wish, I wish I could have been there for that Passover. That was probably a Passover to end all Passovers, to see the two kingdoms that hadn't gotten along, to come under one head, to submit to the, to the invitation from King Hezekiah. I mean, that would have been quite the day in the temple celebrating that Passover. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And then comes the promise. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. God will be with us if we are of one mind living in peace with one another. Another scripture from Paul's letter to the Philippians, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. Back to the unity again, with one mind, the unity again, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Now, like so many admonitions in the Scripture, the Scripture is filled with admonitions, the New Testament is filled with admonitions, and now that you are a disciple, then do this. Live this way. Operate this way in your life. Handle your money this way. Handle being a father or mother this way. Handle being a church leader in this way. The Scripture is filled with admonitions, and many of them are repetitious, meaning we're told over and over again, such as the walk in unity. But nowhere does God say it's going to be easy. It's going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be a piece of cake. And I think that's why he says things over and over and over again. Because he knows it's not going to be easy. You live in a fallen world, for heaven's sakes. You are fallen. You live among people that are fallen. It's not going to be easy, which I think is why God has said things over and over and over again, saying the same thing. Because it's not going to be easy. Nevertheless, we're commanded to do it. And we have no justifiable excuse to say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I mean, the thing that people will, will say to me privately when they tell me somebody they just can't stand, and I say, well, you, the Lord calls you to, to love them. Well, you, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how it feels. And somehow that's supposed to get them off the hook. I just kind of look at them at that point. What can I say? I can't argue with them. All I know is what the Lord calls you, you to do. It's not about, well, if they did that to you, well, then you're off the hook. It's like, he just calls you to do it. So I think either we're going to do it or not do it. Yeah, I might not know how you feel. Don't you know I've had my own situations? I know how I feel when those things happen, so I'm, I'm not ignorant about how these things feel. And I'm under the same commands that you're under. People say, well, he's up there. He's living a different life than I live. He doesn't know. Well, I can't argue with you when you say, well, you just don't know. I, I mean, I, I can't win that argument. But I, I, 
put my pants on the same way you put your pants on, okay? It's the same, life, same struggle. I just happen to be up here, that's all. My life's not much different from your life. So <clears throat> there will always be a reason to divide. There will always be a temptation to divide. And, you know, there will always be people encouraging us to stay divided. There's always somebody ready to, to tell you, well, you shouldn't forgive them. You shouldn't have to forgive them. You shouldn't be a... I mean, if one of you here that's married, I'm going to pick on you, John, just because you're, I, I tell you, you're married, happily married. Suppose you and Lindsay are going through some rough times. And tomorrow at work, you decide to tell somebody. You know, Lindsay and I, would, things aren't going smoothly lately. We've been having some really rough times lately. I tell you, there'd be somebody there who would say, well, you shouldn't have to put up with that, John. She shouldn't treat you that way. You're a good man, John. There'd be some voice there at work telling you that you should take the exit door. Am I right? That goes for all of us. Any one of us thinks maybe we're sick and tired of doing the right thing, and maybe it's time to bow out. There'll be somebody nearby with a voice saying, that's right. You shouldn't have to put up with that. Your husband shouldn't treat you that way. Your wife shouldn't treat you that way. The pastor said that. There's always some voice. And I can tell you who's behind those voices. It's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but there will always be the voices encouraging you to do the wrong thing. <clears throat> God chooses to forget our sins when we're under the blood of Christ. We must choose to forget the sins of other people. Just leave them in the Lord's hands. Leave them in the Lord's hands. Let him deal with them. He's much better at dealing with people than you and I ever are. We have to be, choose to be like-minded with those who are in the body of Christ and refuse to be separated. And again, as we tried to emphasize last week, God has promised to move wherever there's unity. If we want to see the Holy Spirit move in our midst, walk in unity. Yes. You know, last Sunday when I finished up, I, I suddenly told you that story about Parksburg, Pennsylvania, and the Upper Octorera Presbyterian Church. And I just had another thing to come to my mind right now, just as I was finishing up in my last statement. Um, I mentioned last week that that event in Parksburg, Pennsylvania was one of the things the Lord was doing in the late 60s and early 70s to bring back an emphasis, a renewal of the Pentecostal gifts or what you might call the charismatic gifts in the church. And it was impacting a lot of churches, mainstream churches, Lutheran churches, Episcopalian churches, Presbyterian churches. It wasn't just your Assembly of God and Foursquare and, and, and what we consider more Pentecostal churches. But if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, the early 1900s, um, there was a huge event then that brought a renewed emphasis to the moving of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it took place in a place called Azusa Street. Some of you have heard that. Probably around 1905. I don't know. I wasn't playing on sand. I would look at the facts a little more. But there was just an amazing move of God in this tiny building in Los Angeles on Azusa Street. And people were coming together and worshiping the Lord in unity, people from different backgrounds. There was a tremendous, miraculous move of the Holy Spirit and outpouring of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, healings and speaking in tongues and all these, these things. Do you know what the undoing of Azusa Street was? Do you know, few people know, what led to his demise? What led to his demise was there were both white and black people in Azusa Street worshiping the Lord together. And some people said, I'm not worshiping with somebody of that color anymore. And they decided to divide on the basis of color, of skin. And that, my friends, was the end of Azusa Street. So again, we're coming full circle here. God moves where there's unity. At the point at which you and I decide not to be unified, whether it's over 
the color of skin, the style of worship. Um, I'm not going to eat their kind of food at the church potluck. Or those services run too long, or they don't run long enough. Or whatever it is. Or some interpretation of an end times doctrine. And you want to be pre-trib, and they want to be post-trib, and somebody else wants to... It, there will always be something. But at the point at which you say, well, <laughs> I've had it. I'm telling you, that's when the Holy Spirit quietly steps away. And you don't even see him leave. And you just keep having church. I don't know why this is so important to me right now, the last two months. But it really is. It's like if we want to see the Lord do great things here, we have to be unified with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Or else the Lord will tip, the Holy Spirit tiptoes away and we'll think he's still here. <laughs> he doesn't feel welcome here because of our disunity. So on that note, amen. Amen. amen.